All right, so this is the main experiment investigation that proves that light acts like a wave. This is Young's double slit, and you're probably gonna do this as an experiment, but it might come up in an exam as well. So just a reminder that Young, when he had his experiment set up, he didn't have such things as lasers. So he had a candle and he sent the light through first a single slit and it diffracted outwards from there. And then that went to a double slit where it diffracted again. And he ended up with his pattern on the screen. Now the reason that he had the single slit was to produce a coherent source of light. Okay, it's not as coherent as a laser, is it? But it's better than just the candle as is. So that meant that all of the waves arriving at the double slit were in phase, or rather, if you want to go with the Ponzi definition, they all had the same phase difference. But of course, nowadays we have lasers, don't we? And that might be attached to an optical bench or something like that. And then we have our double slit slide there. And then we have our screen where we have our diffraction pattern created. Now Young's double slit equation is this, W equals lambda D over S, where W is fringe width or fringe separation or fringe spacing. I prefer width because it starts with a W. Now what is that? It's the distance from center of one max, that's a bright spot, to the next one. So if that's our diffraction pattern there, then it's gonna be in between like that. That's gonna be our W, the centers. Now, as per usual, there's a couple of different ways that we can do this. We could change the wavelength of light, and we could see that if we have a bigger wavelength of laser light, then that means that we're gonna have a bigger fringe width. It's gonna diffract more. Rule of thumb, bigger wavelength, bigger diffraction. But we're probably not gonna do that. We're probably gonna change either D, that's our screen distance there, or it's gonna be our slit separation. And so we're going to change our slide out for something else. It really is up to you which one you do, but if you don't have lots of slit separations, if you don't have lots of these slides, then you're probably gonna be changing D instead. Let's go with change D first. So we're gonna measure D with a meter rule, and that is the distance between the slits and the screen, not the laser and the slits. What are we going to ensure? Ensure laser light hits slits normally. In other words, it hits it bang on. We don't want to hit in it at an angle, otherwise our diffraction pattern is going to be skewed. And it is also a good idea to keep the distance between the laser and the slit constant. Theoretically, that shouldn't make a difference, should it, if we change it, because it's only this distance here that matters. But the light is going to diverge, it's going to spread out a little bit as it goes through the slit. So it is going to make a small difference. Not super important, but worth mentioning. You could argue that actually it's only the total distance that affects that, but hey, that's why I say it's maybe worth mentioning, maybe not. Keep slit separation the same. And we're not gonna measure that because it's probably gonna be written on the slide. And then we get on to measuring the fringes, don't we? We're gonna measure the width of 10 fringes. So we're not just gonna measure one because because these are gonna be quite close together. We're gonna to end up with an imprecise value if we do that. There we go. Just bearing in mind that the first one that you measure from is going to be your zeroth one. So we're measuring from the zeroth one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now we're gonna measure that with a 30 centimeter ruler, resolution one millimeter. Now you could measure using the center of the fringes. However, they're not going to be very clearly defined. What are clearly defined though are the dark fringes, better defined, you're gonna end up with a more accurate value. So that is measuring from here, and it will be more defined than that. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you're gonna be measuring all the way to there. That's our 10W. That makes your readings ultimately in the end 10 times more precise. Divide by 10 to obtain mean W. It's more precise if we do it that way. So we're gonna obtain W for five or so readings, maybe more. And let's say that we go from one meter to two meters. We're not gonna go below one meter because fringes will be too close together. It's gonna to be very imprecise. Our certainty is gonna be massive. And then from our equation, we can see that if we have W equals lambda D over S, if we divide by D on this side, then we end up with lambda over S. So if we plot a graph, of 
W against D, that's it there. W, D. Then we can see that the gradient is going to be equal to the S, W over D, but also lambda over S. So then all we have to do is calculate lambda equals gradient times S. Everything needs to be in meters, obviously. And then we can compare with value on the laser. And if it's visible light, we should be looking at a wavelength of the order of magnitude times 10 to the minus seven. If you're not changing D and you're changing S instead, then our equation changes a little bit. So because we have W equals lambda D over S, we can see that W is inversely proportional to S. That means that we cannot draw a graph of W against S and get a straight line. No, instead we have to do one over S and that gives us a straight line. Then the gradient is gonna be equal to W times S, which according to our equation, is equal to lambda d, so we can get our wavelength that way if we're changing s. A couple of risks you need to be aware of. Laser light can laser light can cause damage to the retina of your eye, so you must avoid looking directly into beam and any regular reflections. If laser light hits a piece of paper, then you can see it, can't you? You can see it, but you can see it at any angle, which shows that the laser light is being scattered in every single direction. However, if you point it at a window or a mirror or something like that, if you see it reflecting off there, it's because you're looking directly down the reflection. And so that means that all of that energy is going into your eye, not a good thing. When you do the experiment as well, you might see this. You might see gaps in the diffraction pattern. This is due to single slit diffraction also occurring. So when light goes through a double slit, yes, we obviously get the double slit interference taking place, but we get a single slit diffraction pattern as well. Let's put it this way. If you covered up one of the double slits, then you would see this, but with solid light, which shows that we have really big fringes that are being caused by the single slit diffraction that's taking place. The fringes are still there though, they're just invisible due to interference from single slit. Or we can say overlapping, I go with interference. Sources of uncertainty, well, there's not really gonna be a huge uncertainty in our big distances there because it's big and our resolution of our meter rules are usually a millimeter or a centimeter, it's about 1%. S, well, we can't say what the uncertainty in that is because it's just written on the slides. Your biggest uncertainty is gonna be in your fringe separation, but again, it's still not gonna be that much. We can say the uncertainty is going to be the resolution of whatever you use to measure it. But of course, the uncertainty divides by 10 if we divide our values by 10 to get our means. So that's it. I hope you find this helpful. And if you want to see me doing this in real life, then you can click on the card and it'll take you to the video that I made for Marsbury Science. If you have any suggestions on what you might want to see in the coming practical videos, then put it in a comment down below. Really appreciate your feedback. And I'll see you guys next time.